Hello everybody, I thought I'd do a book haul today because my book buying has had a bit of a theme this year. If you've watched my reading vlogs, you know that I had a hard time finding a good book to read in 2021. The situation has now changed, thankfully, but for a while I was desperate. And I thought maybe it would be a good idea to buy myself some new classics to get excited about. Because with those, of course, they might turn out to be awful as well. But at least it won't have been a complete waste of time to read them, because at least it will mean that I will have educated myself on them and will know what people are talking about when they talk about them. So I bought myself some older classics from the 19th century and some modern classics. Some of them are thrifted, some of them I bought new. I usually buy classics used in online used bookshops, but at the moment I like to support my local shops and classics usually come in inexpensive editions anyway, if they aren't critical editions. So let's start with the oldest ones. The earliest book I bought is Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott. I'm a bit miffed because it was supposed to come in this edition. I don't like these beige penguin popular classics anyway. I don't like the look of them, I don't like the feel of them. And this one I think has a particularly revolting cover image. I think I might go and craft some kind of jacket for it so that I don't have to look at it and can just pretend that it is a green one underneath. I just like these, these green ones, they are so nicely malleable and I, just, I think it's a very friendly and positive green. Um, but yeah, Ivanhoe and Sir Walter Scott, Scotland's big famous novelist. Um, fun fact, he died the same year as Germany's arguably most famous poet Goethe in 1832. He wrote a lot of very romantic historical novels, um, Scott that is, not Goethe. Um, and most of them are set in Scotland or about Scottish issues like Rob Roy or Waverley, the heart of Midlothian. But Ivanhoe it's, is set in England and it's a story about chivalry in the tradition of a medieval epic, like an Arthurian epic. But it is set in the time of Robin Hood and Richard the Lionheart when the latter returns from the crusade and tries to reclaim his throne. I've wanted to read some Walter Scott for a while now because he is just such a big name and I've always been fascinated with the fascination that surrounded him and the downright hype that surrounded his novels during his lifetime. Apparently his fans would go on downright pilgrimages to the places that he wrote about because he made these places seem so idyllic and worth visiting and he gave them such a romantic appeal. He was apparently a huge boost for tourism in these places and apparently some people and towns and villages even wrote to him asking him to please include them in one of his novels so that they would experience an influx in tourism as well and so that their economy would be boosted as well. <laughs> this is such a charming thought, I think, that this happened in the very early 1800s. To be honest, the book by him that I've always been most interested in is The Heart of Midlothian, which is the story of a woman from Edinburgh, I think it's a milkmaid, who goes on a quest to London to save her sister. Her sister is in prison and is waiting to be executed and the protagonist wants to try and get her sentence commuted. The heart of Midlothian is the name of the prison. Midlothian is the Scottish county that Edinburgh is in and the prison 
was, I think, part of the administrative building of the region of Midlothian. So it's, it's in the heart of Midlothian, metaphorically speaking, the administrative heart. And I think if my memory hasn't made this up completely, which is entirely possible, but I think there is a plaque in, in the pavement in Edinburgh where the heart of Midlothian used to be or the entrance to it. The reason that I bought Ivanhoe now and might pick it up before I read the heart of Midlothian is that this is the heart of Midlothian and this is Ivanhoe. You get my point? To be fair, um, the heart of Midlothian has a huge appendix in this edition and a long introduction and it, it only has it it's under 600 pages long in this edition and Ivanhoe in this edition is a little over 500 pages so there's not that much of a difference but this is also so heavy to hold I could of course get it, um, get an ebook version of it, but it's a bit, I don't know, especially with long, big classics such as this one, I prefer to read it in a physical format. Okay, I'm going to screw up chronological order here because I've got one more Scottish romantic historical novel, this one from the 1920s, I think. It's Midwinter by John Buchan. I've always been curious but also a bit wary of John Buchan because he was just such an old, well-off, conventional male. And I've just never been sure if he was worth my time. <laughs> but I could not pass on this one for three euros, I think it was because this is a tale of Bonnie Prince Charlie, or rather of one of his followers, I think a fictional character, who gets sent on a mission to recruit more Jacobites for the final big uprising and the bit for the English throne, the one that ended with the disastrous Battle of Culloden. I am again, fascinated with the fascination and also with the symbolic power that the figure of Bonnie Prince Charlie has held in Scottish literature, poetry, folklore and folkloristic art and music for nearly 200 years now. And I also bought Leaves of Grass by Ward Whitman. This is a volume of, I think, 12 poems about themes of mysticism and the sensual experience of nature and other pleasures. And I think it's important to know that there are two editions. This is the original 1855 edition, but there is also a revised deathbed edition that Ward Whitman revised in his later years. This has happened a lot in the history of poetry, and I think the earlier editions are usually the more interesting ones, because the older poets' revisions tend to temper down the exuberance of the younger poets' style and their way of self-expression. And the result is not an authentic product anymore, or at least it's not representative of the poet's actual frame of mind at the time when the poem was written. The worst example in all of the history of literature that I can think of is Goethe's revision, the old Goethe's revision of his early poem Ganymede. Editing Eva here, I'm afraid I got my mythical narrators mixed up and the poem is in fact not the Ganymede but the Prometheus. Ganymede is a poem that exists too though, but the Prometheus is better. Okay, carry on. That poem contained one of his most famous or infamous word creations. Um, for the Germans, the word is the famous Knabenmorgenblütenträume. 
even if you don't speak German, <laughs> you will have noticed the length of that word. And it is a very evocative and also slightly self-deprecating compound noun creation. But the older Goethe was apparently a bit embarrassed by and did not agree with his younger self's sense of style and his passionate way of self-expression and tempered it down to the simple Blütenträume. And this is just so sad and I think we can all be grateful that the early edition is alive and well and is I think even the more widely circulated one. So the word Knabenmorgenblütenträume remains alive in the German lexicon. I mean it's not like I use it every day but I could if I wanted to. My next book is actually two books in one, two novellas, and that is Daisy Miller and The Turn of the Screw by Henry James in this spectacular Penguin English Library edition. And this brings my Penguin English Library editions collection to a whopping three books. <laughs> I also have great expectations in this edition, which I bought to replace my Menji edition that I had at first and I think this this remains unread or largely unread to this day but I have read it before and I also have Where Angels Fear to Tread by E.M. Foster which I found in a little free library and it's good as new I, I don't think it's ever even been opened I haven't read this one yet, although I have enjoyed E.M. Foster in the past. I liked Morris, but I loved A Room with a View. Not so sure about the film adaptation, I think it's a little bit cringy, but it does have my favorite movie kissing scene of all times. So on the whole, I'd recommend the movie anyway. But I'm going off on so many tangents today. Um, the Turn of the Screw is a ghost story, or rather, maybe it's a psychological thriller in the original sense of the word. We follow the protagonist, a young American woman, who goes to work as a nanny um, supervising two children, two orphaned children, I think, in an old English manor house and weird things happen or she starts to see weird things and the children are acting strangely and apparently it's one of those mind fucks where the reader doesn't know if those things are actually happening or if the narrator is it even a narrator is, is she a first person narrator yes she is if she is only imagining these things or if she is lying to make herself look a certain way and judging by what i've heard about the book the ending is extremely open and none of these questions get answered which is something that i really like um, Daisy Miller, on the other hand, is the story of a courtship between two Americans in Switzerland and in Italy. And I think it's about the difference of the values between the different cultures, but also within the cultures. And I think it's a lot about cliché and prejudice, and I think it's satirical. Daisy Miller is the shorter one of the two, and I mean, it's a very slim book to begin with, so maybe I'll even read Daisy Miller first. But I originally bought it because of the turn of the screw. I don't know if you knew that, but the recent Netflix production, The Haunting of Bly Manor, is a very loose adaptation of the turn of the screw. And now we are moving, I think, into the realm of the modern classics. I have The Good Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford, which I bought mainly because it's such a nicely slim classic. This is the story, a, a story about two dysfunctional English couples in Germany at the eve of the First World War, and then I think during the First World War or at the beginning of the war. 
and I also have a Second World War modern classic that is contemporary to the events that it describes. It's put out more flags by Evelyn Waugh in this very nice pocket penguins edition, <laughs> which I like because it's so nicely simple, the design, and I just like the color orange. Um, this is a satirical novel that follows an assortment of English socialites in 1940, maybe 1941. It was published in 1942. I loved Bright's Head Revisited by Evelyn Waugh and I've always wanted to pick up another book by him, but I somehow never have. So it's really a high time now. And I bought another satirical novel about the Second World War, this one written a little bit later. It's Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. And this is set on an American naval base somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea on an island, I guess. And it's set during what will turn out to be the last month of the war. And it's the story of a group of friends who are desperately trying to survive the war by trying to get out of having to fly. Unfortunately, there's this rule in the military or in the officer's handbook that makes sure that everybody who tries to get out of service or is trying to be found unfit for service for mental health reasons is kept in and made to go into combat. Um, and this is the Catch-22 of the title, but it's Heller's invention. This rule does not exist, or at least it does not and did not exist in writing. If you've watched my reading vlogs, you will already have seen me talk about Catch-22, but also about my next book, which is A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. This is a dystopian novel about a a gang of teenagers that terrorized the streets with their ultra-violence in this dystopian future. I'm a little bit nervous <laughs> about going into this book because so far I only know Anthony Burgess's playful side because the only book of his that I've read so far is A Dead Man in Deadfoot, which is a story about the playwright Christopher Marlowe who was stabbed to death in Deadford, a suburb of London, and this stabbing was rumoured to have been in connection with the intelligence service that Marlowe was rumoured to have done for the Crown. Um, the book is written, is told in the voice of a contemporary of Marlowe's, and it's just a firework of linguistic creativity. And this is, I think, also going to be the case with A Clockwork Orange, in which these these teenagers, this gang that we follow, have their very own lingo. But it's, of course, I mean, there were some fairly dark scenes and themes in A Dead Man in Deadford as well, but I think it was altogether much more tongue-in-cheek than this one is going to be, I'm sure. And I also have The Stepford Wives by Ira Levin. This is a satirical novel about a couple who move to Stepford and the desperate housewives there are disturbing to an extreme degree. This might be, it, it might be stretching it a bit to call this a classic, but at least it's a genre classic. I don't know, can a book from the 1970s be called a classic in 2021? And I guess videos like this always beg the question, what makes a classic? And I think the only workable answer would have to be broad consensus. And of course, that always takes time. But of course, there are fast tracks <laughs> to a, a broad consensus. And I guess the moment an author is accorded the Nobel Prize, I think his whole work instantly becomes a classic, become classics of world literature. And 
So I also bought, and that's not the reason that I bought it, but I also bought um, Kazuo Ishiguro's An Artist of the Floating World. And this completes my collection of Ishiguro novels. The only book of his that I don't own anymore is Nocturne's, his volume of short stories, which I didn't like very much, but I now own all of his novels, yay. Anyhow, these are all the books that I wanted to talk about today, and I think they are all the books that I bought this year, with the exception of those that you saw me talk about in my reading vlogs, which are all contemporary and very recent releases of the last couple of years. I did get some more books out of little free libraries, but I'm not sure if they are worth talking about, at least at this point. And in any case, they don't fit in with the classics theme, except for... I only just remembered I found this hardcover edition by Faber and Faber of Ezra Pound's Cantors. I have no idea what to expect from this but I'm thrilled to have this and to be able to dive really deeply into Ezra Pound. Unfortunately, there is no commentary whatsoever in here, but I feel so cool having this hardcover edition sit very pretentiously on my desk. But this is it. These are all the classics that I have acquired this year. Got to go now, got to go to the little free library and get rid of some books. Some books that I didn't like to make room for all these new and hopefully amazing ones. As always, I'd like to hear from you and like to hear what you thought about these books or if you have any preconceptions about these books as well and also what you think on the topic of classics. Bye guys, thanks for watching!